five minutes after 10 o'clock. Thank you for tuning in. Jerry Seinfeld had a, a bit that he used to do in his comedy routine where he would talk about getting into a taxi cab in New York City and just trusting the driver. As crazy as the driving may seem from the back seat, you're confident that that guy behind the driver's steering wheel is is a professional and knows what he's doing. And, and that was his joke. His joke, well, he, knows, he must know what he's doing. He's a professional, right? Meanwhile, right. you're thrown all over the back seat of the car. <laughs> and that was the comedy <laughs> element of that statement. Um, but this, there's some truth in there that I want to apply to our next conversation that we're going to have. If I uh, take my car to my mechanic, who was Matt, by the way, um, I just leave it there and, and, and go home and, and wait for him to call me and tell me it's done. And I just trust that he's going to know what to do, right? right well, it's, exactly. it's common, right? You go to the doctor, you say, ah, my guy knows what he's doing. My lady knows what she's doing, right? They're, they're professional. They went to school for this, right? But when we when we vote for people to run the country, um, one of the, one of the most important things that they should have some understanding of is the is the money, and we do the same thing with them as as Jerry Seinfeld does with the taxi driver. We say, well, I mean, they must know what they're doing. They're the president, right? They must know, right? Right, exactly. And unfortunately, they don't always know. And 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 to be honest, I don't know. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's why it's great to have something written for the layman. It's not easy sometimes to write things that, that even I can understand. Uh, but James Stone has done that. He's written a book called Five Easy Theses, Common Sense Solutions to America's Greatest Economic Challenges. Um, James Stone, he said we can call him Jim, right? Oh, He's yes, the founder, he chairman, and CEO of the Plymouth Rock Group. He served as the Massachusetts Insurance Commissioner from 1975 through 1979. He served as the chairman and commissioner of the United States Commodity Futures Trading Commission. He served as an advisor to governments in three developing countries. And now he's helping us with this book, at least help us decide who to, who to vote for. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful, and by it the is, way. It is not partisan. It's, in fact, he calls partisanship something you'd have to take off the straight jacket of partisan. <laughs> you do. I, I, know. I, I agree with that. Five easy theses. Good morning, Jim. How are you? Good. Uh, glad to be here with you. Where are you calling from? Uh, I'm in Boston. In Boston. All right. Excellent. Um, do, do you agree with me that when we, uh, we we don't put as much thought into our elected officials as we do into our dentists and doctors? Well, a little more than we do maybe with our cab driver. We, we do get a whole <laughs> season to think about which politician to vote for. But unfortunately, they need to find things that reduce to quick fixes and sound bites. They don't really have a chance to go deep into things. And it, it may not be the nature of the process anyway. So what we end up with is, is not solving the big problems during campaign seasons. Okay. What, the, the, we probably don't solve them much during the congressional season either. Okay. So now I, I know we're not trying to be political here, but we have one candidate who is known for being rich. And therefore, you would think he knows something about money. And I'm not asking you to endorse or even condemn him, but Donald Trump is, is, is one name you can't ignore. And if we're looking for somebody who knows money, well, the layperson might say, well, this guy must know money, right? Right. Well... I guess my my view of that is that there's a difference between knowing a particular business and knowing economics, and so he may or may not know mm -hmm. economics, but it's not quite the same as knowing the real estate business. So, you know, I, I think you really, to think about Social Security, education funding, health care funding, those sorts of things, it, it's, it's a little different from, from, being, from being in business. The, the, the pieces that you wrote in the book uh, do cover Social Security, so if we could touch on that one first. What do, mm -hmm. what, do you think, what, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think we could do to correct the course if it's on a bad course? Yeah, well, I think it is on a bad course. A lot of young people are skeptical that they'll ever get anything from Social Security. And the reason they're skeptical is that they have the right intuitive understanding. The, the, the actuarial tables from which the retirement age w was, was developed during the Roosevelt administration, it's like 100 years old. People then lived to be around, you know, in their 60s. Now people live to be about 80. Soon, if we make progress in cancer, they'll live to be in their 90s. 
we just have to change these numbers. Nobody wants to raise the retirement age, probably, but we have to. Mm -hmm. And that's that's called, you know, that's often called the third rail in politics. You don't touch it. But the fact is, we have to. Yeah, we do have to. And aren't we? I I thought we did raise it, but it's it's a slow... We, we don't do it. We don't tell people who thought they were going to get it tomorrow that they got to wait ten years. It's a slow process. Well, we raised it, but not enough because the science of, of increasing longevity is just moving much faster than the degree to which Congress had the nerve to raise it. And you'll notice that no politicians really talking about it during this race. And you know, right, right. the the subject of income inequality always comes up, and. I feel that when a person is a CEO of the company or he owns his own business, he has uh, grown up, he's honed his skills, he's made it possible for his company or the company he works for to succeed. So he should have that uh, higher salary than the uh, normal uh, working class person in a different department. I don't understand why the politicians and other people constantly attack the CEOs and what they make. Well, I'm a CEO myself, so I certainly am not going to say that everybody should get paid the same. Uh, I think uh, Adam Smith, who's my hero, would roll over in his grave if you talk about paying everybody the same. That doesn't make any sense. Right, but, that's what, I, that, that's what I, I agree with but you on there are on limits. That. But, but there are limits, because our founding fathers in this country, they really wanted to have a break from the European system where you got ahead by bloodlines instead of merit. They wanted to change that. And our success has been based largely on having a system where you do get ahead by merit. Well, if we let too much money flow to the top, and then we don't tax it, we don't tax it at a death as an estate tax, and it passes on to the next generation, you'll end up back with bloodlines. So it's a question of degree. More Mm -hmm. money for the CEO? Sure. All the money to the upper tenth of a percent? No. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about angry voters this year. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason that there are angry voters is that the median income hasn't increased since 1974. A lot of wealth has been created, but all of it has gone to the top. So yeah. it's a matter of degree. Yeah. You're right in what you say, but we passed a reasonable degree. But do we tax the corporations or do we tax the individuals? If you, if, the, the common reply to that is, and I, I'm, I'm waiting for your reply, not that I know anything, but if, sure. if you tax the, the corporations, it'll trickle down to the consumer, so ultimately it's always the poor guy paying the tax. Well, and that's probably true when you add it on to the price of goods. So I do think you need to tax the individuals. And the, 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 it may not be popular these days, but the estate tax is probably the fairest tax there is. If you want to have a meritocracy and not an aristocracy, you just can't have everybody have whatever head start their father, grandfather, or great-grandfather built for them. You'll end up with an aristocracy. So people are right to be angry that the average person just hasn't moved ahead in 40 years, and the rich have. So, it's, again, it's a matter of degree, but I do think you need more taxes at that end of the spectrum. The book is called Five Easy Theses. Our guest is the author of the book. It's uh, He is James M. Stone. He, he gave us permission to call him Jim, so that's why you're hearing us uh, use the, his inform, the informal. We're not okay. trying to be uh, informal, but he mm-hmm. gave us permission to. Mm-hmm. We've, we've got to take a little break right now, Jim, so uh, on the other side of the break, we'll continue talking about it. Um, and I, I'm sure that some people want to call in, so if you're okay with that, I will open up the phone lines. Sure. We'll, we'll take a little break and we'll be right back. If you do want to call in, Jim just said okay for, um, for that. So 622 9622, we'll take a break and be right back. The weather is brought to you by MyFWC.com. Safe boating is no accident. A delightful Wednesday with some sunshine and a high of 83 on the coast, 90 inland. Wednesday night will be partly cloudy, those 64 inland, 69 at the coast. 
For Thursday, partly sunny and very warm. High 84 at the coast, 91 inland. For Friday, sunshine and some clouds. There may be a late day shower or thunderstorm. High 86 at the coast, 92 inland. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm meteorologist Joe Lundberg. Hi, this is JP from Penn Flooring here in Ocala. I would like to invite you to come in and visit our spacious showroom where we have solutions for every style and budget. From wall-to-wall carpet to hardwood floors and tiles, we have an unsurpassed selection of flooring. At Penn Flooring, we've provided quality customer service with a family touch for over 25 years. Visit our website at penflooring.com or come by our showroom, 1201 Southwest 17th Street, just over the bridge. Penn Flooring, quality customer service with a family touch. Tuesday, May 17th at 10.30, Higher Education Radio will be here with the College of Central Florida, University of Central Florida, St. Leo University, and Webster University. Be sure to listen to learn the latest information about your higher education. You need to plan for tomorrow today. So mark your calendar for Tuesday, May 17th at 10.30 a.m., Higher Education Radio. It's information you can use from these fine schools and your friends here at WOCA. The nuns at Queen of Angels will never be the same after Dolores moves in. Sister Act wants a movie now live on stage at Ocala Civic Theater May 19th through June 12th. After witnessing a murder, Dolores hides out as Sister Mary Clarence and turns the little church upside down. Call 352-236-2274 or buy online at ocalacivictheater.com. It would be a sin to miss it. The Orlando Fringe returns its 25th anniversary festival, May 18th through the 30th, with nearly 1,000 performances from local, national, and international performing arts companies. There is truly something for everyone at the Orlando Fringe. For tickets and information, visit OrlandoFringe.org or call 407-648-0077. We hope to see you on the Fringe. Orlando Fringe, 25 years bold. Uh, 17 minutes after 10 o'clock. Uh, thank you for tuning in. James Stone is our guest. He's the author of the book, Five Easy Theses. We want to talk about some of the other topics he covers in the book right now. Um, one of the things I was thinking of during the break, Jim, is this, that um, just eight years ago here in our city, we had a situation that was so strange because the, the, the economy had made it impossible for a person working the job of a firefighter, a policeman, a, a deputy, a teacher, uh, that, 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 the, those pay grades, those folks couldn't buy a house because the prices of house yeah. in 2008 was, even in this little town, was unbelievable. So they were forced to be paying more money for rent than they would have in previous years and now, thank, thank goodness things corrected themselves. Um, but but that was not their fault. It was the fault of, as you say, the, the people who are really the ones controlling the economy, which is the the one percent. Well, yeah, and there's another culprit there. You know, um, my my book Five Easy Theses is is full of things that. I call them easy, it's a little bit facetious, that probably don't sound logical or right at first, but I hope that people will get convinced that even though these are controversial, that they are sensible, and one of them has to do with the price of housing. We drive up the price of housing at the same time as we drive up our national debt and our deficit by giving this actually nonsensical interest deduction on mortgages. It's a very popular program, but it makes no sense. The Only the top third of the population itemizes deductions, so the whole bottom two-thirds is getting nothing, and particularly the bottom third who are renters, they get nothing from that deduction. Mm -hmm. They just have to pay more taxes as a result of it. The next third gets very little because they don't itemize, and then within that top third, Basically, people with middle-sized houses are subsidizing people with big houses. Right. The closer your house is to a million dollars in value, the bigger your subsidy. So all of that adds up to a, a giveaway to 
raise the price of housing. That's what it effectively does. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the problem you were talking about. And by the way, the corporate interest deduction is worse because the the, the deduction for corporations for interest is just feeding corporate takeovers. It's feeding corporations having more debt and less equity. We we could solve the whole national debt problem, the whole annual deficit at least, um, simply by getting rid of those deductions. I was going to ask you to talk about the bailouts that we've we've seen with the banks uh, and with the car companies. Uh, mm-hmm. were, were, was that a smart move? Did, did, did it save America, or did, was it a dumb move? Well, you know, by the time we got to the middle of 2008, the beginning of 2009, the bailouts were probably necessary. I hate them, but I think they were probably necessary to keep us out of a depression. Mm-hmm. And... And, you know, what was wrong with them is that it's like there was a big fire in a house and you rebuilt the house, but you didn't build it any better than before. You didn't make it fire resistant. Mm -hmm. So what we did wrong is we did the bailouts, but we didn't downsize the banks. We didn't downsize the leverage in the financial markets. And we didn't uh, fix the things that allowed the 2008 crash to occur. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was the mistake. Yeah, and uh, you you talk about loans and uh, uh, things like that. Now, how about the student loans? Because when a student is going to college and they take out these loans, they know very well that it is a loan and they need to pay it back. So, how come now all of those some of those students are looking toward the government to say, "Please excuse me from the loan," that they don't want to take the responsibility of paying it back. Oh, well, you know, I'm more sympathetic with them than it sounds like you are, because I think our education system really isn't working very well. It used to work quite well, and the the future depends on it. But like 70% of people aren't going to go to college at all. They need to have vocational training skills. We don't give them those. They go on to work without the skills. And and then those 30% that go, they get these loans you're talking about. But if you get a, lo- a commercial loan for your car, your house, or something, you can refinance it when interest rates go down. You can't do that with your student loan. That's right. And we've made college so expensive that they have to get these loans. It's, it's not as though they did it for fun and then later want to welch on it. It's the only way to pay for college for a middle-class person. If you're brilliant or if you're rich, Everything works just great in our college system. If you're not, you got a big burden, and I'm sympathetic. Uh, in, in addition to paying for education, you do in the book talk about education itself and how we uh, perhaps need to take a second look at that. Um, one of the one of the campaign battle cries is about the Common Core. Um, g- give me your thoughts on, on yeah. that. Yeah. Again, uh, like many of the subjects in the book. Uh, what what I recommend may not be the popular drift of things. I think standardized testing and a reasonably standardized curriculum is a good thing for the country. That's how we know whether we're succeeding in education. And so I like the Common Core and I like standardized testing. Really? I think that those are things that really help us understand how to make education better where it's not working well. I don't know if it's still true, but I I moved from the New York City area to a rural area here in Florida in my last year of school, of uh, high school. And um, because I had grown up in in an urban environment and moved to a rural environment, I did not have any credits that were required here in the rural area um, regarding agriculture. (laughs) No, nobody was asking me to study how to milk a cow up in New York, okay? But down here, they had to. So the Common Core, I don't know if it would work across the board because the, the kids who might end up going in or are more likely to go into something agricultural yes. um, would need those yep. classes. And the kids, on, oh. the kids on Long Island, I don't know. They're not really going to need that unless they're on eastern Long Island where there are some cows. Mm-hmm. Absolutely right. 
So I'm not suggesting that 100% of the curriculum be in common everywhere. Mm -hmm. but there are skills like reading, writing, and arithmetic yeah. that ought to be in common yeah. everywhere. So if half the curriculum, and not exactly half, I just use that number, um, is common, and the other half is uh, based on what the student is most likely to do later. Again, it sort of plays into my notion that if they're going to work rather than college, they need a different curriculum. And as you say, if they're agricultural rather than urban, they need a different curriculum. But, the, but, but that's beyond the reading, writing, and arithmetic half. And that's the part I'd like to be see standardized. Uh, earlier, you used the word facetious. Uh, your book, from time to time, contains humor. You uh, really need to have that in this life today. <laughs> yes, you do. There's a lot of people saying that this is not a very funny political season. You got to find a little bit of humor everywhere. Oh, I don't but know. It is a serious. I think, time. I think the late night. I think Jimmy Fallon, Jimmy Kim. I think they would disagree. It's a. It's a real funny political. <laughs> it's a real funny political season. So they're them. having a good time with it. Yeah. <laughs> you would be a great talk show host. I don't know yeah. if you've ever considered doing that, but you, I just, I just love the way you speak, the way you articulate, the way you've thought through your thoughts. You'd have a lot of people who disagree with you, but that's okay. That's the way it works. I mean, that's the way we all learn. I'm not, I'm not afraid to have disagreement. You know, if you're going to make progress, then you have to talk about change. Well, change I'm, means disagreement. Here's how I mean, we've done talk radio for a long time, and even if even though it's a small market, we've had some pretty amazing guests mm -hmm. like yourself and yeah. some pretty amazing conversations. And and I think the one thing I've learned from the years we've done this is that there are very intelligent people who disagree with me and i have to respect i have to respect that intelligence and i have to say okay if they're really smart and they think totally different than me then maybe there's something i need to listen to rather than trying to overtalk them to 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 shout them out or whatever uh which i think a lot of talk show hosts miss that part of it by the way yeah Disagreement is at the heart of debate, and debate is at the heart of democracy. And so, if you believe in democracy, you gotta have disagreement from time to time. A absolutely. And some of these kinds of issues that I try to address are ones that, for for understandable reasons, politicians don't want to come near. But they're the important ones, and they have answers. And uh, you really know how to get to the crux of things, whether you're a, a blue-collar worker or someone at uh, your financial level, uh, level, sir. You don't talk down to anyone. You listen with open ears, and you try to solve the problem. Well, I'll take that as a compliment. I, I certainly hope that's right. But if you had a talk show, you'd probably get angry now and then. <laughs> <laughs> just, just now and then, or, or at least just, you, know, just, just uh, you, you would use your button to a lot. I use my button a lot. Um, uh, <laughs> well, I'll learn from you if I'm offered one. <laughs> uh, five easy theses. I have a copy of the book. Let me give it away right now. If you want the book, call me. It's yours. The number is six two two nine six two two. The rest of us have to go buy it. Um, do you have a website for the book? I do, I do. It's www.5easytheses.com. And the website has some nice videos on it. It's got a little quiz that's kind of fun. So I urge people to go to the website. Or better yet, just buy the book. All it's right. a wonderful book, too. It's a great How read. How is the uh, weather in, in Boston? You said you're in Boston, right? Boston? Yes. Yes, and we have beautiful weather finally now. Oh, good, good. One of these days. I grew up on Long Island, but I never got to Boston. I had this, oh, well. I had this song that played in my head. Welcome Please come to come to visit. <laughs> uh, Jim, thank you. That was, that was a fun interview. Very insightful as well. I, I really think you'd do great as a talk show host, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that very much. Uh, thank you. All right, we will take a break. We'll be right back. The weather is brought to you by MyFWC.com. Safe boating is no accident. A delightful Wednesday with some sunshine and a high of 83 on the coast, 90 inland. Wednesday night will be partly cloudy, though 64 inland, 69 at the coast. For Thursday, partly sunny and very warm, high 84 at the coast, 91 inland. For Friday, sunshine and some clouds, there may be a late day shower or thunderstorm, high 86 at the coast, 92 inland. From the Florida Weather Center, I'm meteorologist Joe Lundberg.
This is James Snyder inviting you to join me each Sunday morning at 9.30 for Sunday Joy on 1370 AM, 96.3 FM. Broadcasting from the Paddock Mall Studios, this is WOCA, Ocala, Gainesville, The Villages, 1370 AM, 96.3 FM, The Source. Fox News Radio, I'm Lillian Wu. Bernie Sanders racks up win number 19 with his West Virginia victory, though Hillary Clinton maintains her delegate lead. As for Donald Trump, he meets tomorrow with House Speaker Paul Ryan, who hasn't endorsed him. If we make a deal, that'll be great. And if we don't, we will trudge forward like I've been doing and winning, you know, all the time. Speaking on Fox and Friends this morning, parts of the country's midsection reeling from rough weather. 20 counties across western Kentucky and southern Illinois reporting storm damage. But the most damage was by a large and violent twister that carved a path in Mayfield where resident Marty Winfrey had only seconds to get his neighbors and himself to safety. They kneeled down beside that truck and a tornado took their trailer and left them there by the truck. The American Red Cross has set up an emergency command center. Matt McLean with Fox News Radio affiliate WKYX. Fox News, we report, you decide. Sometimes what you want most from your car is nothing. No headaches, no surprises, no anxiety when it's late at night and you're on some distant freeway in a thunderstorm. Owning a certified pre-owned Mercedes-Benz can be that anxiety-free experience on every level. You know you're in one of the safest and most thoughtfully engineered vehicles on the road. And with an unlimited mileage warranty, you can drive as far as you want for up to three years, with roadside assistance included. Your sense of confidence and adventure are as unlimited as the warranty itself. Now you can drive the car of your dreams and realize that nothing is everything. And during the certified pre-owned sales event going on now through May 31st, you can receive two years of complimentary prepaid maintenance and